And um, I've gone through the ABCs as one would approach this patient if one were an emergency room physician or a neurointensivist. Um, first, we pay attention to the airway, and in general, if somebody's Glasgow Coma Scale is less than or equal to 8, one would assume that they are unable to protect their airway, and one would recommend endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation. Um, this probably wouldn't be the case for this particular patient, so his airway should be okay. And if the patient does get intubated, we generally try not to keep these patients hyperventilated unless there seem to be um, acutely herniating, in which case you can consider transient hyperventilation um, to lower the intracranial pressure. Next, coming to the blood pressure, we'll talk a little bit um, more in detail in the subsequent slides, but at least when the patient first comes to our attention, one needs to think more in terms of what the cerebral perfusion pressure is likely to be, that is, what is the difference between the mean arterial pressure and the intracranial pressure. And if you have somebody who is suspected to have a very high intracranial pressure, you want to be a little careful and try not to lower the blood pressure too much to, uh, and not to compromise cerebral perfusion. The choice of the drug that you use to lower blood pressure also becomes important. One generally wants to avoid venodilators, so drugs like nitroglycerin are not preferred for lowering. Um, blood pressure in the setting of an acute intracerebral bleed. In the United States, at least, we prefer nicardipine and labetalol as one of the two commonly used antihypertensives. In recent years, we're also seeing um, clavidipine being used quite often. When um, The other question that often comes up is when should we call a neurosurgeon? Should we call the neurosurgeon immediately to the emergency room to see all patients with an intracerebral hemorrhage. And in general, I think one of the uh, two points that one can take is that if one has a patient with a cerebellar hematoma or if there is an acute obstructive hydrocephalus where a ventricular drain might be helpful, these are the two situations in which the neurosurgeon should be involved uh, relatively early in the course of the disease. There are really no strong evidence-based guidelines on when to monitor intracranial pressure in these patients, but again, in general, extrapolating from the guidelines that we have for patients with traumatic brain injury, if the Glasgow Coma Scale score is less than or equal to 8, one would generally expect that there would be a high incidence of uh, finding a patient whose intracranial pressure is high, and we might want to consider insertion of an intracranial pressure monitor. And again, um, in the acute setting, we would consider osmotic therapy like mannitol or hypertonic saline only if we suspect that there's an acute raise in intracranial pressure and a surgical intervention is likely to be uh, planned in the immediate future. Once we've kind of stabilized the patient, our next steps would be to decide what neurological test, uh, neuroradiological test should be done to try to ascertain the cause of the bleed. And these tests that one might order after the initial non-contrast head CT scan would be either a CT angiogram or an um, MRI of the brain or a conventional cerebral angiogram. Once we've figured out a diagnosis, the next question is where should the patient be admitted? Should it be the ward? Should it be a stroke unit? Should it be an intensive care unit? And lastly, how are we going to prevent and manage any complications that might arise?